Welcome to the Victory Church channel. So glad that you could join me. We've been going through the book of James in a series. We've just finished chapter 1 and I really feel that the book of James is challenging me. I hope it is you in this particular day and age because James demands a response. You can't hide behind fancy words. It comes through with great education but then it immediately demands an application of that. So I hope that you are being challenged but that you're also finding the victory in the application of the Word of God. So let's kick off James 2. Today we're covering verse 1 to 7 and if you'd like to read along it's in the ESV translation. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Alright, so I want to highlight Verse 1, I'm going to read it again, which says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So why do I say highlight? Because when we look at verse 1, he's actually hitting his main point, which is no partiality. He then goes on to bring in illustrations or it could also have been that there was very real concerns in these specific areas. And I want to broaden these because I think we have more partialities in us than we would care to admit. So let's consider first, what does partiality mean? The dictionary definition says unfair bias in favor of one person or thing. Favoritism. Now, when you would consider a lot of the decisions we would make, are we not partial in our decision making? So, I'd like to throw out some suggestions that we could consider. Racism, isn't that a form of partiality? Maybe I prefer white people. Maybe as a black person, I feel with the race. Colored people, Indian, China. It doesn't matter what race we're at. I think something that we might need to consider is that in the nature, sinful nature, through our cultures, the way that we've been raised, maybe we need to confess that we could actually be biased. That the way that we read God's Word, that the decisions we make, we already are running through a cultural bias, a uh, home life bias and the way that we speak and interact with each other is constantly litigated through this challenge that we face. So I would like to consider suggestions around this because James is highlighting a lot of what is happening in our country at the moment and it is also something that we see throughout history that constantly is a challenge for God's people. So let's take an example. Those that put Christ on the cross were actually the custodians of the word and should have been able to know to whom it is they were speaking, that he is in fact the risen Lord. But their obsession with the letter blinded them to the one the letter spoke of. They developed a partiality which blinded them. So. Let's consider an interaction. I often find myself in two different cultures, sitting with white people or with black people. And so my black friends would say to me, 
much in a kind of bated breath, hoping that there wouldn't be any negative response. But there's something in my heart that I realized they would say that the white people are arrogant. And so possibly a white person's arrogance is their partiality, believing that without them, there would be no future. So what am I getting at here is now, in that scenario, a white person's arrogance would be their partiality in choosing themselves over what James is actually talking about here. He's saying, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we receive salvation, this justification, there is something where you have to make an exchange for your partiality. Where you would say, we are the chosen race, or we the chosen color. You would have to surrender that. You're making an exchange where it's no longer the color of your skin. It's no longer the, the brand that you support. Adidas or Nike or whatever it is. Whatever partiality you have, you're exchanging it for the blood of Jesus Christ. Which is the great equalizer in all contexts. Which means we now actually have one partiality only. And one of the places that we see this in the scripture, which I really love, it's a sobering reality for me and a constant reminder as a custodian of the word and as an elder, is when Joshua is busy walking, there's an angel that appears and interestingly enough, he, he actually arrogantly, well to me it's kind of arrogant, you know, he just, he steps in and he walks towards him and he straight up asks him, he says, are you for me or against me? And there's this, to me, in my heart, this humbling, holy moment where he says, Neither I represent the one who sent me. And so, whatever our partiality is, here is for me the sobering reality is that we would need to surrender them to Christ because our partiality now should be this, that it is submitted to Christ. A lot of times when we look at the Bible or we look at our perspective, perception or interpretation of the word, even in that we can be partial not to Christ's will and way, but to our perception of it. And I'll give you an example. Let's consider Peter when Jesus rebuked him and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was emboldened in knowing who he had come to serve. This is the Messiah. There's no way he's getting on the cross. He, so there is a bias that he's developed in his heart, which now is seeing who he is. Therefore, this is what should transpire. Does that make sense? So he's lost the, 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 the bias in the will of God versus who Jesus is. And he's interpreted it. So he's developed his own partiality. How many times don't we do that on a daily basis? For those of you who have children, I'm sure we don't have favorites. I believe you don't allowed to have favorites. But you know, when I sit with teenagers in my office, when I sit with young adults, it seems that there's always a perception, no matter how hard a parent would try, they love my brother more, they love my sister more. And each sibling that I would speak to has the same experience. So there's something of partiality being a huge stumbling block for all of us. And I think there's a new kid on the block. It's called to vex or not to vex. And we're seeing this divide causing again. And Satan is very clever at instigating these types of things. So let's consider right at the beginning, God in Genesis 2, these are the words, God created Man in his own image, man and woman, he created them. So when Satan comes to Eve, she says to him what God told them. You may not eat of this fruit. Satan says, ah, the reason why God doesn't want you to eat of this is you would become like him. It's such a slight variation that it bewitches us. And he's a master at it. You know, we would often look at Alexander the Great and we think he's one of the greatest warriors that ever has walked the planet. But have we considered for a moment 
the angels that Satan took with him. I mean, these guys are in the presence of God, yet somehow he managed to seduce them to pull them away. The reality is you and I are no match for him. Our protection, our provision is that we are submitted to the one who's called us Jesus Christ. And therein lies our firm foundation. Let us assess our hearts for any partiality. So when we would consider this bend that Satan brings in, he brings real subject matter. He doesn't bring in nonsense. So our health is critical. It's really, really important. And if we actually would now sit and get lost in an agenda, we can be pulled off track. So we would have those that would say, you must vaccinate. And then we'd have those that say, you mustn't vaccinate. Now a wall breaks out between the two. And Satan's sitting there having a field day. Better yet, I say this to you and I, your life has been bought with a price. Jesus is his name. You should be subject to him in every way that your partiality be not to the left or to the right, but it should be as this. When people say, are you for this or this? You say, neither. I represent the one who sent me. The one who gave his life for me. And now it is my pleasure and delight to serve his will out for the rest of my days. And we see this being modeled by Paul where there's this argument saying, do we follow this one or do we follow this one? And he says, follow me, comma, as I follow Christ. So as we look at these different scenarios that come up in verse 2, where he talks about a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also coming in. I'd say sometimes we have a prejudice towards the rich. You know, they, well, they had it easy. You know, there's constant envy. There's, so somebody that's now incredibly wealthy has to feel bad because he doesn't fit in. He's got too much of his opulence is now an offense to those that are partial. So in this journey we see in verse 3, if you pay attention to one who wears the fine clothing and say you sit here in a good place, well you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. These are real situations that he's referring to and it's as relevant today as it was back then. But I would say consider this, where else are we partial? Have you not made, this is verse 4, distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I fear this is something along the lines of what happened with Peter. He believes his cause is righteous, but he is moved out of submission. So here's something that I've been asking God to safeguard us from, is that when we're in love with anything other than Him, we know we are being idolatrous, even if it's a good thing. How do we consider this? God has given us work to do. So maybe you're a farmer, maybe you're an entrepreneur, maybe you're a business owner, maybe you're a hard, dedicated worker. If we love our work more than the work giver, therein lies our partiality. And we can be led away even by under good things under the sense of diligence. Consider Peter's loyalty it wasn't his words and his heart, the evidence that he was assuming he's not being partial to anything but this God that he loves. Surely, no, but there is this, that only the Heavenly Father knows all things. So you and I need to ensure that we safeguard ourselves, that our partiality is to no, no specific thing, only to the one. And we are incredibly encouraged in this that we would remember that a lot of the times the things we want to sell ourselves to, a cause, is the very thing that ends, us hang, ends up hanging us on a cross. And we end up with our cause being against God. Let's consider that for a moment. When I was referring to the, to the Jews, the ones that were supposed to be overseeing the law, that surely would recognize the law giver, it was them that through their loyalty and prejudice actually put Christ on the cross. They were partial to their understanding of the writings and so put the very lawgiver on the cross. We are all guilty of this. So in every area of our lives, it would mean we should safeguard ourselves and reassess and check 
Do not let the enemy deceive you into believing that you are safe from this. None of us are exempt from being partial in some shape, size and form. And I believe in the time that, that we're living in right now, any unresolved issue that the enemy has claimed to in our lives, he's calling those debts in right now. And God, as the real move of what is needing to happen right now, is looking for those that will not be partial to those seeds that the enemy has sown, but would lay them down and actually pursue what is his will and his way. Much in the same way where it said, follow me as I follow Christ. That journey that could lead to our very end, but we know it is the will of God that we would do because we are partial to the one and the one and only, Jesus Christ. And so as you look at these scriptures and it talks about um, verse 7, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? It is something where again I refer to the very ones that were supposed to be the custodians end up being the ones that blaspheme the very name of Jesus. And so what this tells us, again, is each of us are responsible and accountable for our own lives before God. It means that there will be those that are drawn out by Satan that we would stand against, but it is not them that we oppose. The battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and rulers of the air. It is possible for even myself, all of us are susceptible to being taken captive and we unfortunately would stand as collateral in that. So our safeguarding always is submit to God. Then we can resist the devil and he will flee. Our submission is key. Any person that is looking to be a leader, is looking to having a following, needs first to be one who is submitted. And that submission is submitted to Christ where we know that we are fulfilling exactly what it is He has called us to do and that our partiality is being able to be obedient to what it is He has for us right now. So I'm going to leave you with that and say consider this that you confess that you are partial. You know something I find very helpful in my life is if I try to defend that I do not have something in my life, I'm very susceptible to being blinded by the very thing I'm trying to defend. What do I need to defend? Let us explore every avenue that the enemy might not use it against us, but we might prevail in due time as we continue doing good, being ultimately loyal and faithful to the one that has saved us and called us. So Father, I thank you for those that took the time to listen this morning. I pray for them that in every situation they find themselves, Lord, would you open their eyes to those that are brave enough. Let them, their ears be open to the way that they speak, the way that they think, and the way that they feel. That there where they've even accidentally picked up causes that would blind them and take them off track. Father God, for those that are humble before you, would you allow them to see so they might repent, come into right standing. Would you be gracious to those who are prepared to be humble before you. Father, that you would send able men and women to journey with them as they journey out of and into the preferred future that you have for each and every one of them and us collectively. I thank you that we can pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Again, I thank you so much for joining me today and I hope that you are incredibly blessed and have a good day. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I will worship your It's a new day dawning. It 
It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Yo. Yeah. 